Hey everybody, it's great to be back at B&H. Um, just curious, of course, we turn off the lights and then I do the survey. How many of you currently have the new 600 EXRT speed light? Great, 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 great. How many of you are thinking, is it really worth upgrading and that sort of thing? All right, well, the short answer to that in my world is absolutely yes. And I'm gonna spend the next 90 minutes or so talking to you about why I think this new system is so, so great. So before we get too far down the track, if you're interested in seeing the work I do, um, Silarena.com is where I hide my portfolio. My blog, as Lauren mentioned, is pixelated with S-Y-L right in the middle. You'll see that come up again. And then on Twitter, uh, Sil Arena with an underscore. So Lauren mentioned my Speedlighters handbook. Um, and I'm really, really, really happy to say, as of last night, I am done with my new book, Lighting for Digital Photography. And if you've ever written a book, you know that extreme joy when your editor tells you you're done. It's a wrap. Um, so woohoo. And then as we mentioned, um, I've got a tour this fall. It's going to be here in New York on October 28th, which is the Sunday right after Photo Plus. I want to give a big shout out to Canon USA for um, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you about this new gear. And a lot of people think that I'm completely tied into Canon USA, when in fact the real story is, while I'm not completely tied in, I do have a close relationship with Canon Europe. And that's where my journey with this new lighting system began last January. And I've written four articles for <coughs> Canon Europe's website. If you're not familiar with what's known as the Canon Pro Network site, this is Canon Europe's um, tech site and it's a great blog and a great collection of articles so just google Canon Pro Network everything's in English so it's really easy to understand um, and as I said I wrote four white papers for them on speed lighting techniques and then they called me in January and they said we'd like you to write a fifth I was like I'd love to and they said well we can't tell you what it's about and you'll have to sign a non-disclosure agreement <laughs> show you how smart I am it took me three hours after I said okay I'll do that it took me three hours to figure out the potential of what was going to be coming down the tracks. And after waiting weeks and weeks and weeks, signing the NDA, waiting weeks and weeks and weeks, a box finally shows up, and lo and behold, it's six of the pre-release 600 EXRTs and the SDE 3 RT transmitter. So I had an opportunity to play with these things, and they didn't quite have the user's manual done, which was good because I just started playing. And I found that the system can do things that the manual said it couldn't. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But really, it was Canon Europe that gave me the start, and then Canon USA that's been getting me out on the road to talk about it. On my blog, I had the opportunity in early March to um, do a first impressions piece. And if you head back to Pixelated and look for this post, there's eight minutes of video where I'm shooting um, the STE3 and the 600 EXRT system, so you can see it in action as well. So here's the whole family portrait. And we've got the new guy, 600 EXRT, the former flagship, the 580 EX2. How many of you have a 580 EX or 580 EX2? Okay, it's the platform that we all have. And now we say, well, is this new technology worth it or am I just gonna keep going forward? 420 EX, 320 EX, and the 270 EX. So here's what's in my bag. I have an arsenal of these guys that I accumulated. In fact, I have two or three 580 EXs that I've had, I don't know how long I've had them. They're beat up. Um, they're the last speed lights that come out of my bag, but they are fully compatible with everything else. I've got four or so of the 580 EX2s. And then, because of the article that was, that was basically my compensation, uh, was the lights out of uh, so I've got three 600s. So I have a completely mixed bag of lights. I will share with you going forward, I'm going to be buying the 600s and eBaying out the 580s because the new user interface, the new technology, and you're going to have a lot of opportunity this afternoon to see the details of that. Um, I think the 420 is a wonderful speed light, by the way. If you're new to the world of flash, and you want something that you can start with at a very affordable price, these are about $275, I think this is an amazing value. The 320EX is about the same price, it's 250 or so. I'm not as in love with this unit. They put in an LED light so that you can use it on your hot shoe as a video light, 
Well, the interesting thing is on the hot shoe, video lights have all of the shadow killing qualities that an in the hot shoe flash has as well. So the light in your videos coming off the hot shoe while convenient doesn't necessarily contribute a lot of really great shadows, as Lauren mentioned. So I'm not completely in love with the 320. And then the 270, I have one of these in my bag almost all the time. It does work as a little slave. It's tiny. It runs off of two AA batteries. It's great for travel if you've got a power shot and a little coiled ETTL cord. That is a great combo if you're traveling super, super light. Um, so this is one, the EX2 in particular, is the one to go after. The 580 EX2, I'm told, will become or is perhaps very close to becoming a discontinued model. So that Canon's future is very clearly in the 600 EX. So let's take a look at some of the highlights in this system and give you an idea of where we're going to go and the features that we're going to explore. The interactive LCD of this new system is amazing. Um, this system, I can work without my reading glasses, and you're gonna, I'll take you through the menu system. We've got two-way radio. Not only does the master communicate to the slaves, but the slaves, for the first time ever in the history of Flash, actually talk back to the master. And specifically what I mean by that is when a slave is ready to fire, it lets the master know. If you're doing multiple speed light work and you have two or three or four speed lights in the same group, let's say they're all in group B, group B will not check in on the masters being ready until all four of those speed lights tell the master that they're ready. It's absolutely fascinating in terms of, for the first time, we've got an opportunity to have the slaves check back in. Group mode, boy oh boy, this is an amazing feature. I'm going to take you through and talk to you about the details of group mode in a nutshell. What group mode gives us is the ability to turn individual groups on or off individually and to change their mode. So we can run group A in ETTL, group B in manual, and so on. We're going to look at the details of that. We've got 15 channels, and we have 10,000 wireless IDs on each of those channels. The old days of you being um, in ID1, you being in ID2, you being in ID3, and you being in ID4 are gone. 15 channels, it is 2.4 gigahertz, um, which it means that you can use these legally in most of the industrialized countries around the world. And you'll ta I'll take a look, show you the, the channel sniffer. So if you're in an area that has a lot of uh, wireless communication going on, or frankly a lot of microwave ovens in use, you can sort out which of the channels is the best one to be on. A small feature, but one that is oh so nice to finally have on a Canon Speedlight. We have a beep. We have a beep. I'm a guy, I get so focused on looking through the viewfinder or looking over the top of my camera and trying to engage my subject that I often am not paying attention to what's going on. And so having that beep, and again, if I'm shooting multiple lights and not hearing the beep off the master until all the slaves have checked in is ready to fire, a small feature, but one that I'm really, really grateful that the Canon engineers have put in. We have something that I really was disappointed about, the 580EX2. On the 580EX, we had that little lever that you could slide off to master and slave. On the 580EX2, they hid that functionality behind what I call the zoom everything else button over there on the right-hand side. And on the 600, we now have that button right there which is a dedicated wireless button. So this is a system that is set up to work and to really excel at working on a wireless basis. And then finally we have a wider and a longer zoom. What I mean by that, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll show you a slide of zoom patterns, but the, at 20 millimeters, all right, how many of you have those little Stofan dome diffusers, little plastic Tupperware boxes that you slip on your flash? And a lot of us for many, many years have used those Stofans when we use like a Lastalite softbox or the new Impact Quickbox, which by the way is a fabulous. You're going to see that in one of the shoots. And we'd use the Stofan as a way to kind of diffuse the light inside of the softbox before. Well, now we don't have to because at 20 millimeters, that light is spread out wide so you can fill up a big umbrella. You can fill up a big softbox quite nicely. Okay, and on the other end, 200 millimeters gives us the ability to zoom a little bit more tightly, and I use the zoom as a creative function. So the 600EX, 
we have six modes. All right, so we've got ETTL, we've got manual, we've got multi. Those are the three, if you've been shooting the 580s, you're very, very familiar with. Then we have two flavors of external metering. So we've got external manual and external auto. And that's actually what that little sensor is. That's an old school thyristor circuit. I don't shoot weddings, but my friends who do tell me that they find this functionality here to be very, very helpful. All right. And then finally, the last mode, which I mentioned I'm totally in love with, is the new group mode, giving me that ability to turn individual speed lights on and off. 600 can work as a radio master or a slave, and it can work as an optical master or a slave. If you've come here today with a question, which was one of the very first questions I asked when I opened the box last winter, is there a way to blend radio and optical slaves? The answer is no. I had dearly hoped that we'd take a master radio, a 600EX's radio master, send the signal over there to a 600EX as a radio slave, and somehow turn it into a mini master that would retranslate the message optically to my existing pool of 580s. That technology, apparently because of timing issues in terms of getting everything to translate, isn't available. And I don't know that it ever will be, to be perfectly honest. Um, so this can work if you have one 600 and a whole bunch of 580s. You can use this in the old school optical master mode or slave with all of your 580s. You just can't combine radio and optical. I mentioned uh, the Zoom gel holder. There is, for those of you who like to use gels, there's an integrated gel holder now that you get with a speed light and pre a couple of pre-cut gels, like a half CTO and a CTO. Um, I'm totally in love, and, and the world knows that I'm totally in love with Dave Honnell's gel system because I can rip those things on and off very fast. They're oversized. They don't have to be precise. And when I'm gelling a sunset shot and trying to blend flash, of those of you who saw me when I spoke here in February, I went through a shoot, and I showed how I can gel flash as fill flash at sunset using a CTO gel. When the sun is crashing towards the horizon, I don't want any kind of gel that requires me to be precise. And that's why I like those Honnells. I can slap them on and rip them off and put the next one on until I find the one that blends just right. 600EX, like the 580EX2, has the external power port. So um, if you've not discovered the Bolt power pack, it's about 80 bucks, holds up to eight AA batteries. It is a fantastic accessory that you can get here at B&H because if you're, if you're a power shooter, that recycle time is a huge issue. And in my test, I found putting in the Bolt power pack I think it's CP4 is the model number. Putting that in cuts the recycle time by 60%. So if it took two seconds to recycle pre you know, previously, it's now down to whatever the math is, like 0.7 seconds. All right, so the STE3, and I have both up here, and I'm more than happy um, to have you guys come up and push the buttons and turn the dials and all of that afterwards. Um, Four modes, so we've got ETTL, we've got manual, we've got multi, and we've got group. We don't have the external metering because that's not designed into this unit at all. This only does radio, so if you're thinking, oh, I'll get the SD3RT and I'll use it for with my 580s, that's not going to happen. All right. These little guys have been so popular, they're kind of hard to get. So B&H has them come in, and then they sell out, and then they come in, and they sell out. So about 320 bucks. Now, one of the great things, and you'll see in a moment, is that the design between the 600EX and the SDE3 is exactly the same. If you learn the buttons and dials on your speed light, then you already know how to work the remote speed light. So here's a comparison, though, looking back at the 580EX2 and the 600EX RT. So a couple things I'll point out. One you can see that the screen is substantially larger. All right, with my old eyes, that's a great feature. Because look, even there, ETTL, that's big and bold. I can read it. There's ETTL in the old system. The new system has contextual buttons. On the old system, see how the, the labels for the buttons were literally silk screened right on top of the buttons? In the new system, the purpose of each button changes depending upon what mode you're in. So we have, all of a sudden, a lot of functionality that comes right up to the surface. The other great thing about this screen system 
is that it's an active matrix LCD. And what that means is that the icons are not baked into the LCD. In the old system, ETTL, for instance, is always ETTL. That portion of the screen is never used for anything else. Manuals next to it. We're going to look at sync, first, second, curtain sync, and high speed sync. And you, if you use the 580, you'll say, oh, yeah, the second curtain sync is over here. The high speed sync icon is up there. And these icons would jump around. And if you use the flash this month and then don't use it for a few weeks and then pick it up again, you go, where was that icon? In the new system, the icons stay in the same place. It is so much more intuitive, so much easier, so much easier to use. And believe me, that's why I'm so passionate. If it makes me more comfortable and less stressed during a shoot because I can find the buttons and dials, everybody thinks, oh, gosh, so you know this, you do it all the time. It's like, yeah, but I also get stressed out just like everybody else when I'm on a shoot. And buttons all of a sudden start confusing me. So there's the new and the old. And we're going to jump right in here. So I want to take you through. And I'm generally going to use the magenta circle, to, or you'll see in many of the shots, just my fat old index finger. Uh, one of those two icons is going to tell us what button we're pushing. And then I'm going to highlight uh, with an oval or a circle what's going on up in the screen. So very quickly, we've got a big, fat mode button. And this system, if you work weddings or events or you shoot in dim environments, it is so simple to turn the light on. You basically just hit the center set button, the one in the middle of the donut wheel, and everything lights up for you. So the mode button is big and fat and easy to find. So one press on the mode button, you're in ETTL. And then it follows a pattern we're very familiar with. Then we jump over from ETTL to manual. Then we jump over to multi. Now we see external automatic and external manual. Those are two modes that we have in the 580 EX2s. But to actually use them, we had to dig down into the menu system a little bit more. And then finally, we've got group mode. Now one of the things I want you guys to keep in mind is that group is used in a couple of different ways. And I regret that the engineers chose to use the word group. I totally love this functionality. I'd kiss them if they were here, because this functionality is amazing. The ability to assign individual groups to specific modes or turn them on or off from the back of my camera, huge, huge asset. If they come up with a slightly different name, because now we have two different types of group functionality. When we're using wireless, if we have two speed lights over there that we want to fire at the same power, we'll put those into group B or C. Master, remember, is always, hopefully you remember, if you were here earlier, Master is always a member of group A. So that's kind of a confusing thing for me. And I kept hitting the, when I see GR, um, and I'll point one out, when I see GR down here in the contextual menu, and I kept pushing it, trying to get into group mode, and it wasn't working, it wasn't working, and finally it's like, aha, yeah, group is now actually on the mode button. So that's the confusion. Zoom, very much like your 580s and your 430s, all right? So you hit zoom, and then you'll turn the wheel. In this case, the A indicates it's automatic. So how many of you use your zoom as a creative tool? Anyone? Actively zooming, as opposed to keeping your speed light in auto. So here's the thing. In auto mode, what your speed light's trying to do is position the flash tube forward and backward in the reflector. The house has a circular reflector, and the tube goes forward and back. And depending upon where the tube is positioned determines whether the light goes out far and wide or whether it concentrates but has a longer throw. So the engineer's idea is we should try to light everything that the lens is seen, but no more. Very convenient if you're a photojournalist and you're shooting run and gun type of photography. My type of work, though, I think of as being more pictorial. I, I, I try to take cinematic approaches to lighting my portraits. So I'm not generally chasing after the people I'm photographing. And I find that I take my speed lights out of automatic zoom 99.9% .9 of the time. So if that's a feature in your speed lights you've not yet explored, try that. <coughs> try that. So basically, you just hit that zoom button. And what you're going to see is it's going to switch to M. And then you turn what I lovingly call the donut wheel. And when you get to the focal length that you want to use, you hit set. So for me, if I'm trying just to put a pool of light on a subject's face, 
I'll zoom on my 580s to 105 millimeters, on my 600s to 200 millimeters, and I'll position that speed light so that that light just falls here. Okay? All right. Let's jump forward. So here we go. If you've not ever done this, this is a great exercise to do with all of your modifiers, not just your speed lights. So what this shows us is the flash patterns basically at the various zoom settings. So 20 millimeters, 35, 50, 80, 105, and 200. So one of the things to note is that there's not a huge difference, which frankly surprised me, there's not a huge difference between 105 millimeters and 200 millimeters in terms of its flash pattern. When I first did this, I thought, oh gosh, 200 millimeters is going to be some small circle right in the middle. But the point being, again, that zoom can become a creative tool for you to use. This is a very good thing to do with all of your modifiers, umbrellas, soft boxes, grids, snoots, anything. Find a wall, and you do it right about sunset. Just use a 200th or 250th of a second, whatever the sync speed is of your, on your camera. It's going to suck out whatever little bit of ambient light is around and then you'll see the various flash patterns. It is so, so helpful to do this by locking my camera down on a tripod and having the speed light with the various modifiers on a stand in front. I get this shot and it's very easy to compare from frame to frame to frame. Now if you want to get the extra bonus points, when you're done doing this series, then you go over to the wall and you turn your speed light horizontally and you do the same kind of things. Because what you're going to see and you can, you can interpolate it here. At 20 millimeters, the vertical reach in a speed light is huge. And at 200 millimeters, the vertical angle on a speed light is relatively short. So if you literally put your speed light alongside the wall and fire sideways, you can see that pattern. This also works with soft boxes and umbrellas and grids and snoots and everything. Such a handy way to understand what your lights are doing. And by the way, when I'm doing this, I'm running this system in manual mode so that I'm adjusting the power of the speed light on my own. Okay, so let's just now, we're going to jump across. We, we started at zoom and we're going to explore two of these three remaining buttons. Um, so flash exposure compensation. Flash exposure compensation is a function that's available when we're shooting in ETTL. So ETTL is Canon's automatic flash mode. And a quick refresher, the way that ETTL works, when you fire the shutter, the camera sends out a pre-flash, 1 32nd pre-flash. The camera then evaluates how much light is coming in and where that light is coming in. And if the speed light's in the hot shoe and if it's pointing straight forward and if you have the right lens, the camera may also take the focusing distance off of the lens all of these go into an evaluation, that's the E in ETTL, an evaluation of what should be the flash power. And then in a split second, the camera sends that back up to the speed light. Speed light, if it's a master, communicates that out to the slaves. And then as the shutter opens, all the speed lights fire at whatever power setting the camera determined. I use ETTL when my subject and flash are moving. Either the flash is moving, or the subject is moving. When the subject of flash distance is dynamic, when it's changing, I'm in ETTL mode. Why? Because if a light is close, it doesn't need to be as powerful as if when the light's far away. So if I'm photographing events and I'm running around and I'm doing quick candids, and one time I'm three feet and then I turn and I photograph these gentlemen over here and I'm 10 feet away, I don't want to have to figure out in manual and do test shots. I'm going to let the camera fire in ETTL. So whenever I'm in that situation, subject to flash distance is changing, I'm in ETTL. Anytime the subject to flash distance is fixed, which is almost always the case when I'm shooting location portraits, lights are mo not moving, subject's not moving too much, I'm not moving too much. In that instance, I'm in manual, because manual is consistent from shot to shot to shot. So going back to ETTL. In ETTL, the camera, in my opinion, its job is to come close to the light that you need. It's actual rocket science, in my opinion, that it does as much as it does. 
the one thing the camera does not understand is my vision as the photographer. So oftentimes in ETTL, I say I need more or I need less light. So on the 600EX, we hit the plus minus button that pulls up that scale. This is all called flash exposure compensation. So flash exposure compensation dials the power of the flash up or down when it's in ETTL mode. All right. If you're using ETTL for fill flash and you want less fill flash than the camera thinks is appropriate, which in my world is pretty common, then I might dial down minus one or minus two stops of flash exposure compensation. All right. There's three official types of sync. And unfortunately, the first one that we're going to talk about, first curtain sync, I don't have an icon to show you because I, Canon has never implemented a first curtain icon. All right, so that's why that circle is there, but it's empty. Now, if I hit the sync button again, all of a sudden, three triangles pop up. This is Canon's symbol for second curtain sync. So quick crash course. What's the difference between first and second curtain sync? In first curtain sync, the speed light fires right after the first curtain in the shutter mechanism opens fully. And in second curtain, it fires just before it closes. Why does that matter? Well, it matters if you're using a flash in a dim environment with a long shutter speed. I photographed my son from my new book, and I apologize. I should have thrown those photos in here to make this more clear. Um, Second curtain sync gives you the ability to capture the motion of the subject as a, as a blur behind the subject. If you shoot that kind of experience in first curtain sync, what you end up with is that ghost coming out of the front of the person. So that's first and second curtain sync. If you're shooting faster than a 30th of a second, it doesn't matter between the two. There, at fast shutter speeds, there is no second curtain sync. All right, And fast, in this case, is defined as a 30th of a second. Now, high speed sync, the flash bolt H icon. This is a huge, huge tool that a lot of speed lighters have yet to explore. Now, I live in the central coast of California. I live in a sun-drenched world. So quite often, you're going to see in some of my shoots, and I'm going to show you a shoot where I implement high speed sync. High speed sync changes the way the speed light fires. So it enables us to use shutter speeds that are faster than the camera's sync speed. That's really important to me, because I'm using fast shutter speeds to dim the ambient light. And I'll show you specifically in shoots, the shoots coming up, how I do that. So the nice thing is that sync button is really easy to read and find, even in the dark. And you just hit it, and it rolls through first curtain sync, second curtain sync, high speed sync, and again, the thing to remember, jumping back two frames, when there's no icon right there, then you're in first curtain sync, all right? Big, huge improvement for me that these sync icons don't jump around like they did on the previous generations of Flash. OK, two-way radio. In order to talk about two-way radio, I want to give you guys a refresher for those of you who've never worked with the optical system. I want to give you a crash course in optical wireless. So we're going to look at the old school fundamentals of Canon wireless flash. You've got a master speed light, which has to be connected to the camera's hot shoe. Now guess what? That's not changing in the radio world. We still have to have the master connected to the camera's hot shoe. The job of the master is to send instructions to the slaves. And Canon actually had to add the word optical into the nomenclature when they introduced the 600EX. Previously, we just said it sends instructions to the slaves because everybody knew that it happened via super fast series of flashes coming out of the flash head. So literally, it's part of the ETTL pre-flash and it lights up. Now, which camera or which speed lights can be masters? As I mentioned, the 600EX will work optically, the 580, the 550, and also the macro lights, the macro twin light and the macro ring light can also work as masters. All of these guys here, optical mode only, the 600 is the only one that's going to work as radio. The SDE2, which is the predecessor to the little guy that I have in my camera's hot shoe this afternoon, it's been around 20 years now by my calculations. I, I, for years, I've encouraged everybody to avoid it. 20 years ago, it was rock and roll technology. It was hot stuff. 
but for many, many years it's been incredibly limited compared to other options we have. So I put that on here so none of you guys call me out and say, oh, well, the SD2 can be a master. You're right, it can be, but certainly not one that I like. And then finally, the last thing we have is on models with newer models with pop-up flashes. Use the pop-up in your camera to learn the basics of wireless flash. I've got no complaints about that. Where the pop-up falls short, however, is one, when you want to move the speed light more than 15 or feet or so away from the camera. Two, when you want to put the speed light to the side of the camera because that little pop-up flash is only going out there, it's not going over here. All right. In terms of optical slaves, receives the signals from the master. I'll show you where those super secret slave sensors are hidden. All right. We can have in the optical world any number of slaves. So literally, if we could get 400 speed lights in this room, as long as they all saw the flashes coming from the master, they would fill up this room with light. 600 EX can be a slave, 580, 550 series, 430, and as I mentioned, 320 and the 270 EX2. So here is where Canon has hidden the optical slave sensors. A lot of people have never understood the difference between those little black panels and the red panels in the front of our speed lights. The big red cyborg panels, that's the autofocus assist light. So basically, if you have any of these guys in slave mode, one of the keys you have to remember is that you need to turn the body of the slave so that it's facing the head of the master. All right, let me say that again. Even though we're talking about the future, I want to talk about this is an important part for anybody who's shooting with the previous generation of gear turn the body of your speed light so that slave sensor is facing the master and then use the pan and tilt features of the head to get it going in the direction you want. And you can see here even, I took the, I'm shooting in full sun backlit and I actually turned and zoomed the head of the master to make sure that that signal punched from the master down to the slave. The good news is with radio, all of this goes away. I don't have to worry about the slave eye being blinded by the sun. I don't even have to worry about turning the bodies of the slaves so that they're pointing towards the master because the radio is omnidirectional and it goes through and permeates many, many surfaces. One of the other challenges we have had with the optical system is what I call the angle of coverage. So you've got a speed light in the hot shoe of your camera and as I said with the pop-ups, it's looking to control speed lights out in front. And if the geometry of your shot, for whatever reason, and I seem to specialize and put myself in those whatever reasons all the time, it's like, oh yeah, we could put our speed lights over there and make it easy. Or we could tie them to the turtles walking that way and see if we get them to fire. So you've had challenges in the past. And the best solution that I could come up with are these super long ETTL cords, which I'm still really fond of. And that was basically a way that you take the master off the top of your camera and put it in a spot where all the slaves can see it. OK. So some of the new school fundamentals of Canon speed lights. We've got the two master units, the 600EX or the SDE3 RT. So basically, the way to think of the SDE3 RT is that, let me jump over here and grab both. It's basically the bottom portion of my speed light, but it's a lot lighter and a lot smaller. It's a really stripped down version. Okay, I use the SDE3 RT all the time. All the time, because I really appreciate the fact that if I don't need on-camera flash, then this is what I reach for, because I can see over it, I can see around it, I don't have super strong hands, so I'm not weighting down my camera with a whole bunch of features in a speed light that I'm not using. Exactly the same layout. Now I will say there's one small shortcoming, and for me it's small because I don't shoot weddings. But wedding shooters tell me that they really want autofocus assist light. And one of the reasons this is a stripped down unit is that there's no big cyborg panel on the front. There's no autofocus assist light. So if you shoot events then, and you want the radio functionality, then you're going to be using a 600 EXRT speed light so you can get the autofocus assist panel 
to help you out, okay? All right. So same thing with optical. It's got to be connected to the camera's hot shoe. No difference in that regard. It sends the instructions to the slave by radio, and here we go. This is a feature that I didn't expect to love, but I actually am totally enchanted with this. In the old system, as I said, the master would send the instructions to the slaves by a super fast series of flash pulses, the pre-flash. That would trip studio strobes. So it was really hard to use studio flash and speed lights together. Now, why would you want to use studio strobes and speed lights together? Well, let's say that you've got a really big set and you're trying to create a big broad field of soft light, so you're trying to fill up a seven foot umbrella or a soft box, a studio strobe is gonna do that a lot more efficiently. And if you don't need high speed sync, because studio strobes won't give you high speed sync, if you don't need high speed sync, then studio strobes are great. And when, what would you use in that situation? What would you use a speed light for? Well, you might tuck a speed light because of its small size actually into the set and use it as an accent light, a hair light, a rim light. Lots of creative ways to combine big and small flashes, but for a number of years, many of us who had access to both sets of tools didn't do that because it was a real pain to have the speed lights trigger the strobes prematurely. With radio now, if your speed light is in manual mode and not an ETTL, if it's in manual mode, these things are seamless with studio strobes now because there is no pre-flash. In radio ETTL, there is still a pre-flash. That's how the camera is measuring out how much light is coming back into the lens and where that light is coming back so it can evaluate what the appropriate flash power setting would be. But in mixed lights now, boy, radio is really, really singing. The only, right now, the only radio slave we have is a 600EX RT. And as much as I had hoped, there is no backwards compatibility with radio. There's no way to get a 600EX to relay the signal and become an optical master. As far as I know, Canon has no intentions of doing a bolt-on adapter so that we can take our old generation of speed lights and get it to work with the radio. At some point, we just have to say, is this functionality worth it to me? Do I appreciate the user interface and so on? And make a few pennies for eBay by selling our old gear and jump into the new world. And believe me, I gnashed my teeth for a while when the 600EX finally arrived at my house, because I didn't know what the specs would be until I got these things and started playing with them. And I started ticking through everything on my wish list and saying, can I get this, can I get this? And I was really upset. And then I finally said, you know what? I just have to let that go. Because the things I can do with this system and the user interface are so, so great. So I've already talked about quite a bit of this. Radio eliminates line of sight. We've got greater range. We've got two-way communication between the master and slaves. But let's look at the menu system on the camera first. So in terms of the gentleman's question, what do I do? to get this into optical or radio master and slave. I'm going to walk you through those buttons. So again, dedicated wireless button. Totally in love with this. I'm grateful for the engineers for adding this. All right, so a couple things to point out. There's the button. There's what's happening. And this icon right there tells us that it's in radio mode. I'll show you the optical mode in just a minute. So it's as simple as this. You keep mashing the wireless button. You keep pushing it. This is going to change, and eventually this will change. Let's take a look. So right now, oh, back up. The other thing I want to share is we've got to look in two, two features. We also have to look at this light, all right? And this is, a, I think, a great feature as well. That light right there, not that you in YouTube land can see that, but it's at the top. This light is really important and it will change color depending upon what's going on. Right now, it's red. Well, and that tells me that this is not communicating to any slaves. The one on the screen is green, and that tells me that it's actually linked up to a slave that's going to respond. And the slave, by the way, has exactly the same link button or link icon. And when the slave sees the master, it turns green. It is so cool to be able to say, yep, 
It's totally dialed in. Now, interesting about the radio system, a feature that I didn't expect, is you can actually have multiple masters on the same system. And when that happens, the second and third and fourth masters, anybody who's second to the party, they get an orange link icon. Now, it doesn't really look orange up there, but it certainly is orange on, on the light. So all that tells you is, yeah, you're in a master, and there are other masters who are operating on exactly the same channel and wireless ID system. When would you use that? Well, maybe if you're a, a wedding photographer and you have a second shooter. You can both shoot the same slaved lights, all right? So that's what the orange link means. And then finally, and this is almost impossible to get, but as I showed you right here, when the link is red, that means that it's a master, but it's not hooked up to anything. Or if it's in slave mode, it means it's not seeing the master. So the fact, and let me, I need three arms all of a sudden. OK, so watch, if you would, the link icon over here. OK, I'm hitting, and I'm basically just going to go through. It pops up as orange because it's now a radio master. And that orange tells me, hey, there's another master in the room or in the area that's on exactly the same channel settings. Well, that's what I would expect since I happen to be holding that other master in my hand. And then as I kick it over to slave, did you see how they both went to green? That is great. OK, and then when I jump over to optical, I lose that link icon entirely. All right. So we'll go back through and do it really quick. So master with another master that's on the same frequency and ID system. And boom, as soon as you turn it on, I love that green link icon in the beep that tells me that we're ready to go. So the thing to look at, jumping back up here on screen, um, using the wireless button, master, we've got the radio icon, and we talked about the difference in terms of the colors. Now. I want you guys, if I had a hat or something to give away, what's the difference between those two screens? And please say the color changes. <laughs> OK? The color changes. How cool is this? So as soon as I turn, let's see if this guy will do it. OK. I know I realize this, is, this is, gets flooded out. I'm going to, they'll hate me in TV land, but I'm going over here where it's darker. OK. So um, ETTL mode, not in wireless. All right, now it's slave. And see how that turned orange? OK. Now it's back at, oh, I'm sorry. Now we're in ETTL mode, uh, not as a master. Now we're a radio master, radio slave. Mm -hmm. All right, so that color changing for me is huge. I don't even have to look at the word master. As soon as I see that color change and I get a green linked light, I know I'm ready to go and that this is a slave. OK? So right there is the difference between the wireless and, or shall I say, the optical and the radio. So I'll jump back. There's the radio icon, and there's the optical icon. All right? So they, they adopted the sideways flash bulb. This, no, this is all new nomenclature. All right, so contextual menus. Here's what I want you to notice here. Lower right-hand corner, menu button. All right, menu one, two, three, and four. All right, and then what happens to the labels above? So we'll make that, um, we've got zoom. We've already talked about that. We've got flash exposure compensation. We didn't talk about flash exposure bracketing, and I told you why. I hit that button over here on menu two. Then I've got, all right, anybody know what this is? That's the Canonese's gang sign for my master is enabled. Not enabled, enabled, not enabled. All right, so what that's telling us over there is that as a master, if it's enabled, it's going to fire a flash when the shutter's open. If you need on-camera fill light, then you want your master enabled. If you only want your master to send instructions to the slaves and you don't want it to throw out light when the shutter's open, then you want to disable it. It still works as a wireless master. So that's the functionality that hides under that button. Ratio. Ratio in ETTL is how you get slaves in different groups to have different power levels. So last spring, last spring? I think it was last spring, maybe in the winter. 
I was here and I gave a presentation basically on the fundamentals. And these are all things, um, when I come back in October and do my speed lighters intensive, these are all things that we go deep into in terms of what are ratios and, and what is one to four and what's four to one and why are they different. But the point is right now, that menu button's label changed. If you're trying to set ratio and you want to go from having all your speed lights in the same power level to having group, you mash the ratio button and you'll see all changes. Now I've got AB up and it's like, all right, now, I mentioned at the outset, Canon uses GR in two different ways. And I wish that they had come up with a different name for the new functionality in the group mode. The one where we can change the mode and turn individual groups on and off. Because when you hit GR here, what that means is we're now going to jump down and change the power ratio between groups A and B. And, I, and if that confuses you, I totally relate to that. Okay, That's why I wrote a 400 page book a couple years ago to help me sort that out for myself. But that's what group mode relates to up here is we're now going to, by pressing group mode, and you see the icon, and then I'm going to change it up, and I think I show, and I've changed it to 4 to 1. So the way to translate that, this means that the speed lights in group A are going to fire at a power level that is two stops brighter than the speed lights in group B. That's the 4 to 1 ratio. First number is always group A, second number is always group B. As for why 4 equals two stops, that's a completely different topic. But that's photography math. So whenever, very much like a 580EX, if you're running that system, when you get the ratio you want, then you come down here and you mash the set button in the middle of the donut wheel. So some functionality is very, very intuitive. The part that is relatively quick to pick up that may not be intuitive is which button do you push. But the good news is, the labels on these buttons keep changing. And I say this sincerely, when I don't see what I'm looking for, I keep hitting the menu button and cycle through the loop until I find the menu button that I'm looking for. And then I push it. When you see this U-turn icon, all that means is we're going to go back up the menu system one level. So if I were to press that button right now, we'd head back up. OK. So let's talk about some group mode or some groups. All means all the speed lights in your slave groups are going to fire at the same power. Now in manual, and I have to confess, when I'm shooting multiple groups, I'm typically not doing that in an environment where subject to flash distance is changing. So I'm typically in manual mode. It is so, so easy. If you're trying to get your head around shooting multiple lights wirelessly, Learn the system in manual mode, and then go learn the system in ETTL. It's much, much easier. In, by hitting ratio, basically, you keep mashing the ratio button, and it goes A and B. That's two groups. You hit the ratio button one more time. That's three groups. You hit the ratio button, if you have it in a 5D Mark III, a T4i, 1DX, um, any of the, the 2012 releases, you hit that ratio button a fourth time, group D comes up and group E comes up. We have, on the new generation of cameras, up to five groups. So back to the ratio button. So in manual mode, the way you get more groups to show up or you get groups to go away is you keep mashing the ratio button, and it's going to add groups, and then it will take them away. All right, meaning that it goes from five groups back down to everything's in one group, meaning all. And you can start over, all right? So there we've got three groups up. Now. I'm going to hit the group button, and I select which group I want to work on. All right. So in this case, I want to change the power in group C. <coughs> so as soon as I hit group C, that button, which in the previous frame said group, now that button isolates itself and changes its functionality. And it says, OK, hit me again, and I will give you access to the power in group C. It is, I, honest to God, without reading the user's manual, you can learn this stuff because it is very, very intuitive. And the icons are big enough so that I don't have to have my glasses strapped on all the time. Going back to it, once you get the power set in, you basically use the donut wheel and the set button. So use the donut wheel to set the power. Use the set button to confirm that that's your choice for power. All right, so I move it to 
quarter power, I hit the set button, and now group C is locked in at one quarter power. It wasn't that hard to do it on the 580EX2, but it's really, really easy to do it on this new system. All right? Group mode. This is, again, the only thing I have to complain about group mode is the choice of name. All right? Because we're already using group to refer to slave ID groups, groups A, B, and C. All these gr slaves that are teaming up or slaves, even if they're working individually, that you want to have fire at different power levels. So now we're using the word group in a slightly different manner. And in this mode, all right, what we're doing is we're going to gain individual group level control. So to make this work, we've got to have a couple of things. You already see this coming. We've got to have the new generation of Speedlight or the transmitter as the master. We have to have a 2012 or newer camera. So the 1DX, the 5D Mark III, the T4i are the three cameras that I've played with this on. I'm assuming that, and I added this in this morning, the newly announced 6D will have the same functionality. Okay? You don't have access to group mode on a 5D Mark II, for instance. So if you've been looking for a legitimate excuse to give to your wife as to why you really need to have the 5D Mark III, tell her still said so, um, because you've got to have group mode to hang out with the cool kids at the photo meetups. <laughs> okay, so as I mentioned, it gives us five groups. Thanks for Canon for not doing six, otherwise I'd have to have a finger sewn on over here. All right, why would I want to use five groups? Well, let's say I'm at a meetup and I can get everybody's speed lights. You brought one, you brought one, you brought one, I got three. All of a sudden we got like eight or 10 or 12 of these things. Well, that's pretty cool. Now I can do a key light, I can do a fill light, I can do a hair light. I can do a couple of spots on elements in the background or in the foreground, and I can control the power of each of those groups individually and independently. Now, if you've got a 580EX2, let me share this secret with you. It was given to me again by my friend Rudy Winston at Canon USA. And Rudy showed me what I called the, the freelance or free agent wireless mode. So if you've got your speed light setup, your 580EX2 as a slave, hold down the mode button for three seconds. It's got to be turned on as a slave. Hold the mode button down for three seconds, and you'll see an M flash on the LCD. What that now means is that that slave is a manual controlled slave. You dial the power up or down on it individually, and it will fire in conjunction with all of the other slaves. So before, it was kind of a hidden, undocumented feature. And that was a way for us to get similar kind of functionality. But we had to control each of those free agent wireless slaves by hand. We literally had to walk over to them and dial the power up or down. Now we can do that from the convenience of our camera. And we can, and this is the part that I really, really love, now we can turn the power of those groups on and off. So if I just want to see what the hair light's doing, I can shut everything else off. We access group mode. And if you keep saying mode after group, that will help you distinguish between the group functionality that we have when we're controlling individual power levels on speed lights. But look what happens here. You hit with it in master, you hit mode, and group comes up. And then all of a sudden, it'll go through. And you can actually scroll through this. And the buttons change, on, off. That's basically saying, do you want any individual group on or off? And right now, we're working in mode A. And if we want to work in A, great. If we want to work in B, and so on. And we want to change the power. So now, here's a confusing situation. We have GR twice on our screens, right? We have group mode and we have group functionality here. So you just have to kind of, and I, I don't know, it's, it's, G, it's going to be GR. They didn't call me. Say, so what do you think? What do you think? I would have said, no, let's not have two GRs. That's confusing. We've got two groups up here on the screen. All right. So just jumping through really quick. All right. So I changed the mode in the A group to manual. I've got the others in ETTL. Now, all right, so pop quiz time. 
in manual, I set the power up or down. That's what manual is. In ETTL, what is it that we use to adjust the power because it's actually an automatic calculation from the camera, right? The camera's deciding what the flash power is, but we fine tune it with flash exposure compensation. OK, thank you very much for that, because flash exposure compensation is a very powerful tool if you're using ETTL. And so that's why when we see B plus or minus and B is in ETTL, that's basically saying, do I want plus or minus up to three stops of flash exposure compensation? On menu three is where we find channels and wireless IDs. Okay, Very, very handy here. Like the old system, slightly more complicated than the old system, but like the old system, all the masters and slaves have to be on the same channel. And now, this is new, they all have to have the same wireless ID. So let's split that apart. We have 15 channels. These are official worldwide channels in the 2.4 gigahertz range. And within each of those channels, we have 10,000 wireless IDs. So theoretically, we could have 150,000 Canonistas at the big Canonista party. And if we all worked it out, we all would not control each other's gear. All right? So that's a huge step forward. Let's take, a, let's take apart and take a look at what's going on. So if we hit scan, all right, this is on menu three under most of the modes, if not all of them. You hit scan and you come up with the channel sniffer. All right. So this is the channel sniffer, and it's showing me a graph of channels 1 through 15. And don't, this is the way my world works, OK? Anybody live here in the city speaking another quick example? Last night, I, you know, tornado watch, I guess. Guess who was trying to fly into LaGuardia just as that tornado watch was called? <laughs> Same kind of luck right here, OK? So 15 channels. I happen to have my gear in number two which is the crappiest channel right now to be in? Channel 2. Good information to have. All right. So you can leave this in auto, and it's going to sort it out. And I often typically, because I live in a rural part of California, unless I'm photographing right next to my microwave, and yes, I did try that because I read that microwaves work on 2.4 gigahertz. So I went over and I turned on the microwave. And then I turned this guy on, and you could see that the microwave definitely was screwing things up in that 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. Um, so voila, that tells me something really important. Hey, Syl, you might want to switch out of channel 2, because right now, channel 2 in here is a little bit congested. I can't wait for Photo Plus. I'm going to go over to the Javits with everybody doing their wireless stuff, and I'm going to do a live video blog. I'm going to say, here's how this works, and let's go find out. You know, I don't know. I would s assume that it's checking what it's feeling, it's, you know, what it's experiencing right where you are. So, and theoretically, if you walked 100 feet, potentially those signals are going to change. OK? So, all right. So I hit channel. And very simply, no surprise, you hit the channel button. And you use the donut wheel. And you can dial to any old channel that you want. Thank you for coming, sir. We're going to give away the free speed lights in about five minutes, everyone. <laughs> it's just like Oprah. I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> all right. All right, all right. So we changed the channel. We get onto a good channel. Now, we've also got to worry about the ID. Everything defaults to ID 0000. In my part of the world, that's great. Only you know the cows haven't quite caught up to this new speed light system. <laughs> so um, I don't have an issue. But if you're using the same channel. I mean, if you're at a crowded event, you and I could both be on channel 7. And frankly, 10,000 of us all could be on channel 7. And we could all work it out, being good canonesis. We could all work it out so we each get our own ID number. Now, here's the maddening thing. In the old system, we only looked at the channel saying, oh, yeah, the master's on 2 and the slaves are on 2. Everything's happy. So you look now, master's on 2, slaves are on 2, and you don't have green lights on the link icon. So now, all of a sudden, you've got to look at the wireless ID. So not a big deal, just kind of one of those you've got to know things. So if you've got a secret number, OK, or maybe your anniversary date, guys, if you want to code that in. Um, in my case, it would be 0427, right, Amy? Um, April, tw <laughs> April 27, not that she ever watches me on YouTube. 
Um, so, okay. So, we plug it in, and there we go. All right. We've got a bit of time left, and I certainly want to get to questions, and the gentleman's got some buttons and dials, and I'm happy to help everybody with buttons and dials if you want. But I want to take you through several shoots where I put this new technology to you. So this is a fellow that I met in Kentucky this summer. No surprise, his nickname is Hippie, because he is, and everybody calls him Hippie. Um, and it wasn't until he signed the model release that I learned what his real name was, and it wasn't Hippie, but I'm going to say it's Hippie. Great guy and a master wood craftsman. So my challenge was, and this was just a self-assignment, what I wanted to do was to create a portrait, this is very typical of the work that I do, create a portrait that conveys several things. Who he is in terms of his vocation, who he is in terms of his persona, and who he is in terms of his environment. All right? So if you think about, you got a big tatted guy, well, Hippie is anything but intimidating. He's a, just a big teddy bear, all right? And he's a woodsmith, so having this bandsaw was really important to me. And this is the environment that I created that shot in. Okay? This is the environment that I created that shot in. So, step number one in my lighting technique take a set shot, figure out how the camera is going to record your ambient light. Before you turn on your flashes or any other light, sort out what you want to do with your ambient light. Depth of field control or aperture controls depth of field. Okay? Man, for the last two years, f8 has been my favorite go-to. I used to be in love with 6.3, then I decided to be, you know, whole stop guy, so f8 is where we're at. Alright? I use the shutter speed to dial the ambient light up or down. Set the aperture based upon how much depth of field I want, and I define it as shallow, something in the middle, or as much as I can get. If it really matters, I'll whip out the DOF master calculator on my iPhone, and I'll calculate the depth of field, which is not something I did until I started shooting motion. And we were shooting shallow depth of field, and like we'd have like the focus in front of the guy's eyes rather than on it, and I wanted to know why. So F8. Sweet spot, baby. You can't go wrong at f8, in my opinion. Use the shutter speed to take out. Watch the light in the background. Watch the tools back here. I basically sucked out two stops of ambient light. And how did I do that? I took my study shot and aperture priority, and it said, oh, at f8, we're at a 60th of a second. OK. Well, I dial that into my camera, switch over to manual mode, 60th of a second, f8. One stop below F8 is 125th, so I shot at 125th. One stop below that is 250th, all right, so I shot there. One stop below 250th is a 500th. Anybody catch what happens when I switch on a 5D to a 250th? I have to switch to high speed sync, okay? Not a big deal because I'm not pushing the light very far, so high speed sync would work fine here without an issue. So I dialed down the ambient light in this shot. Then I turn on my lights. All right. One of the reasons that I love the radio functionality, yeah, I could put the master on an, an extra long ETTL cord. I've got, this is the Impact Quick Box. Okay. It is a very affordable version. If you've ever wanted the Last Light Easy Box, this is a very, very affordable version that B&H bought out under their Impact House label. Speed light mounts on the back. It's double diffused. Beautiful, beautiful light. I didn't want to have to walk around to this speed light every time because I'm in this wood shop that's cluttered. And literally, I've got my butt up against a stack of lumber, and there's you know, another machine right next to me. Like The less walking I have to do, the faster this thing is going to happen. All right. And Hippie was happy enough to stand there and very patient with me and talking me up, as any good Kentuckian will do, and being a gracious host while I sorted all of this out. So basically, my lighting is the impact quick box, and then this piece of foam core. Can, you know, the nice thing about a wood shop, you've got heavy pieces of wood to hold up cheap pieces of foam core. And there's my second light, OK? So it's literally sitting in the spokes of this flat, of this saw. And how do we know that? Because the next morning, Hippie called me and said, Sil, did you want that speed light you left in the saw? Because it flew about 10 feet through the air this morning. 
So he went into work, turned on the saw, it went, he, he did the whole thing, crashed to the ground, and works perfectly. I Believe me, believe me, Canon Pro Services has repaired many a speed light on the Silarina nickel. Um, so that speed light is lighting the foam core, and it's creating the fill light here, OK? So look at the difference between these two shots. And very specifically, look right here. This isn't a bad shot, but it has a different persona. It communicates Hippie's personality differently than this one. This, to my eye, speaks to his strength, his massiveness, all right? He's not a threatening guy. This just says, hey, he's a big, strong guy. You fill that, sh oops, sorry about that. You fill that shadow over here, all of a sudden, the persona shifts from strength to my eye to one of gentleness. The strength is certainly still there, but that's what that fill is doing off of that $3 piece of foam core, OK? The benefit of the radio is I didn't have to walk back and forth and change all of that. I made my lighting decisions based upon what I saw on the back of my camera. Now, really quick, I just thought of something I want to show you guys. How many of you guys have delved into the world of shooting motion HDSLR stuff? All right. Well, I jumped on that really early, and one of the great things that I came upon that has totally changed the way I shoot stills is the Zakudo Z Finder Pro. Because the way I'm able to make informed lighting decisions on location is that I pull up the images with this bad boy on the back of my camera, and I hit the zoom button, and I can go in and see exactly what those shadow edges look like. And I can see exactly where the light is. I don't use this as a light meter in terms of saying, is my exposure right? That's the histogram's job. Okay? But in terms of making lighting decisions based upon where the shadows fall and what their quality is, the Zakudo Z Finder is a total, total godsend in that regard. OK, high speed sync, as I walk backwards and trip over. So this is my son, Vin, who is a passionate snowboarder. And um, he's been a great sport for many, many years in my, the world of my photography. I wanted to do a portrait uh, self-assignment around the theme of spring fever. Spring was breaking out in Paso Robles shortly after I got all of this lighting gear last spring. The plum trees in back were in bloom. The grass was green, on and on and on. And then was bummed out that basically snow was melting in the Sierras much faster than he wanted it to, and his season was going to come to an end. So I said, OK, well, let's go out and see what we can do with this new lighting gear. So let me construct this set for you. That's my hero shot. All right, That's the shot that I got to. This is where we started. This is how the camera wanted to see the ambient light. Sun's coming from behind Vin. It creates that really nice rim light on the pants and the shirt. And more importantly, I shot botanical and horticultural subjects for years and years. I'll share this quick tip with you. If you're a photographing plant, put the sun behind the petals and blooms because they're translucent. And if you push the sunlight through the petals and blooms and leaves, they look much better than if you bounce the sunlight off the front side of them. So by backlighting the grass and the petals and the blooms, I knew I was getting nicer light through that. Of course, this is a pretty ugly, boring shot. Camera did an OK job, but the camera cannot record the same range of brights and darks, the same dynamic range that human vision can capture. So I dimmed the ambient. Now in this case, I'm already at like a 500th of a second. No, well, whatever it was. And then I dim by at least a stop. I'm well into high speed sync territory. Why dim full sunlight? because it saturates the colors just a little bit. I often make a one-stop underexposure move when shooting in sunlight, because it helps saturate the colors just a little bit. Now, I'm a guy who's not hesitant to use flash in broad daylight, so then I can solve this problem. Because by dimming the ambient light to saturate those colors, obviously Vin, being backlit, is completely underexposed. So here's the three. Here's where I started. Here's my one-stop ambient underexposure. And here's where we ended up. Now, what I haven't showed you is how I created this light. So let's take a look. 
I basically use two Westcott Apollo softboxes. I love for speed light work. I love the Westcott Apollo. They, what they now call the medium, which is the 28, and also the orb, the 42-inch orb. I think those two guys are incredible. So what I did here is I stacked two of them up using C-stands, and in the bottom box, I've got one of my three 600s, and in the top box, I've got two. Now, because I was shooting high-speed sync, which means that I'm losing a two and a half stop, I'm taking a two and a half stop hit in power, I pulled the front diffusers off the soft boxes. So I'm just firing the speed lights into the silver foil. It's making the light bigger, but it's still punching it forward. I positioned two because I wanted more light on Vin's face in the tie-dye shirt that he's known for. And I also, though, frankly, needed light down below. I had this whole thing about how we decode images. And that's one of the areas I went deep into in my new book, Light and Lighting. And there's nothing like writing a book to get you to really come up and understand what your own personal beliefs are and to really kind of translate and decode them. And so I came to understand that as a photographer, it's really important to leave clues for my readers. Now, the idea of a snowboarder practicing on a stack of bricks and a tire is totally ludicrous. And that's part of the shock factor that I was after with this shot. So it was really important that the viewer be able to decode the tread, that that was a tire, relatively quickly, which is why when I lit this, I put a speed light down low to make sure that we had full frame. If I was just doing a location portrait, I'd concentrate the light on his face and I'd just let the natural vignette happen and I'd be happy with it. But in this shot, I consciously had to light all the way down to the bottom. My vantage point, I was standing right there on the third tread of that ladder because I wanted to be slightly above him. I was shooting wide and I wanted to be slightly above him. There's no way that I could line of sight other than moving a master off camera on a long ETTL cord and firing it back into the front of those soft boxes, which is the old way I would have done it. But with the radio, I was able to control this whole system. Even though I was four feet away, the sides of the soft boxes would have blocked the optical signal from a master. And, I, and then, as I said, I would have had to move the master off camera. Somebody else would say, well, maybe I'd use pocket wizards. That's fine, but then you have to get up and down the camera every time to change the power. And when your kid's balancing on those, um, you know, the brick and the sand and the tire, and we're trying to get the shot done before mom comes home and screams at dad for doing this, um, it was really nice to have that speed. All right, so here's a shot I did on a very tight balcony. You'll see the set shot, the set shot, which is a fantastic modifier. Same, you're going to see the same pattern. Here's my ambient set shot. Look how bright. This is San Francisco, all right? We're in the late afternoon shade. The sun line is literally, as we started this shoot, marched its way across the city and is now crossing the bay. But this is how the camera wanted to record the light, and this is a pretty accurate representation of how I remember the ambient light on the city being just in flat, open shade. Well, if I want to saturate the colors in those distant sky and minimize the background, leave enough clues the viewer gets a sense of what it is, but I want to take away all of the distraction. All right, I'm going to do that same thing. I'm going to underexpose by a stop or two, which obviously puts my subject into dim light. So in this case, working on this porch that's like three and a half feet wide, I've got the Casey Beauty dish. Here's a close-up shot of it, which very conveniently stacks two speed lights top to bottom. It creates beautiful light. It's, so you saw the narrow space, and my back was basically right up against this wall on the outside. All right, and again, the geometry is totally working against me. And the sun is crashing. I don't have the luxury of time to go over and take a test shot and go, oh, too much light, make a power change. And go, which if you've got a manual radio trigger, you've got a pocket wizard, or you've got a cheap um, Chinese trigger or eBay trigger or whatever, if you're using those inexpensive triggers, you've got to change that power manually. <coughs> When the sun is crashing on the horizon, you don't have the luxury of time. So the radio enabled me to continue in very tight space. It's not about working over great distances. It's often about being in situations where the geometry of the shot doesn't allow the line of sight from the top of the camera to those speed light. And where are the sensors on Canon speed lights? You recall, they're right up front. So those sensors are right, literally mashed up against the Casey Beauty dish. I've used the KC Beauty dish more in the last six months with the radio technology than I used in the previous two and a half years. Question, yeah. Yeah, um, so you're shooting in manual mode here, right? 
I shoot in manual mode um, in speed light and on my camera a lot. And in this case, speed light's absolutely in manual because there's no dynamism, there's no distance that's changing, okay? Alex isn't jumping off the balcony or something like that. So are you using a light meter or you're just looking at the I'm looking at, um, that's a longer answer. That's, again, speed lighters intensive is an area where I go deep into that. But the shorter answer is I'm using the histogram on my camera to make sure that I'm getting a good digital capture in terms of not clipping highlights and using the shadow side of the histogram basically is my indication of making sure that I'm not crushing shadows that I don't want to crush. I'm using the Zacuto Z Finder Pro to look at that image on my camera's LCD and I shut my the brightness off. There's an I didn't know this for years. Um, I discovered it in my 5D Mark II. There's an auto brightness sensor for the LCDs and when you jump into using the Zacuto, you've got to shut that off. Okay, I generally keep it like at six. I think the scale goes to seven. So I keep it pretty bright. But it's not a calibrated system. You cannot, or let's put it this way, I'm not smart enough. That's not to say that all of you aren't smart enough, but I'm not smart enough to calibrate the LCD brightness on my camera to represent a close approximation of the LCD brightness in Lightroom, for instance, on my Mac. Okay, so I use the histogram because what I'm ultimately concerned about am, am, I, am I clipping highlights, am I crushing shadows? If I've got a good digital capture, then I know I've got the data that I can work with in Lightroom. You feel that's better than just using a light meter? Though. What's a light meter tell you? A light meter tells you how much light is following on a particular spot, but the light meter has no idea about what your intent is as a photographer, nor does it have any information about the color. Light meter is capturing 18% gray. Okay, you know, if the gentleman sitting next to you is wearing a black hoodie. You're going to have to put more light into that hoodie if the texture of that hoodie is important. If we're shooting for the manufacturer of that hoodie, then yeah, the shadow detail in that hoodie is critical. If the shadows crush and, the, and you don't see the texture in the folds because in the black fabric, if that's not a problem, then let them slide off. A light meter is not going to help you determine those two things. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of? Yeah. Okay. All right, so they're getting, there's the hero shot. Just a couple of alternates. The other thing, the benefit of shooting manual mode on your camera and your speed lights and situations that support it is once you get your lighting set up, which takes like 80% of your time, then you can change the composition without having to change anything else. You can zoom wide. The light that's lighting Alex is the same whether I'm photographing her face or her full length because the distance between the light source and Alex isn't changing. The level of that light's not changing because the speed lights are in manual mode. Very quickly, because I want to get to some questions and answers. Gelling. Here's another quick example of a shoot that I did. There's two speed lights in the shoot. There's two Honol gels, a deep red, a deep blue. All right. The red speed light is coming through the door basically on the right side of that frame. So the door's angled at 45 degrees. Let's take a look at the set. This is at an old fort in Maine, Fort Knox of all places. I found this door. I love the patina. I love the stone. And this, there was one fluorescent bulb in this hallway, and this is how the camera recorded the shot. This is the ambient light, all right? And so basically what that door is, there is um, a powder room where they used to store all the black powder immediately off to the right, so it's a 90 degree turn. So this is my ambient study shot. This is my ambient light after I got done sucking all of it out with my shutter and my aperture. I basically, in this situation, said I want no ambient light. I want to confirm that I make the changes. I know that five stops of shutter and aperture will suck out almost all the ambient light indoors, if not all of it. I take a frame with no lights on to confirm. This is a very valuable shot to take. Okay? I turn my flashes on. So I've got one flash around the corner that's throwing his shadow onto that door. And then I actually have the master in the hot shoe of the camera that's firing straight down the hall. Maybe the signal from the master would have bounced off the door. I bet it probably would have. But because I had the radio, it was so easy to control the power level of the slave at a 90 degree angle in a room completely around the corner. So the red light here is being created by the gel coming in from the side. And the blue light is being created from the gel that's on the master in the hot shoe of my camera. OK? So you get, when you work in textured surfaces with gels, you can get these really cool mixes of colored light depending upon which way the light's, which way the light's looking. How long did it take you to get that set up? Three minutes. 
You know, it took me it took me longer to get it set up than it took me to explain to Scott what we were doing and how, what kind of gestures I wanted. Okay, so okay, clamshell lighting really quick. This is um, this actually I guess is a, a section divider in the new book, but I really threw it up there because I want you to look at the lighting top to bottom and relatively speaking how shadowless it is across Anna's hands and face. Okay. This was created with two speed lights. One speed light in the Westcott Apollo softbox on the top, another speed light in the Westcott Apollo softbox on the bottom. This is a classic clamshell configuration. Okay? Camera is literally looking right through and seeing the edge of the softboxes. And then I scooted it forward just a little bit so it didn't see the edge of the softboxes. And I'm using the power to move the contrast, the shadow, up and down between the two soft boxes. The thing I love about the Apollos with speed lights is that silver reflective surface. You fire the speed light backwards into the silver foil surface. That light bounces around and then it comes out that front, which is big, creating big soft light. And you don't lose a lot of light doing all of that. The other styles of soft boxes that you mount from the back have an inner diffuser and then the front diffuser. And you lose more power. You still get beautiful light. But if you're a guy like me that goes to the edge all the time in high speed sync and needs to grab every photon he can, the Apollos, and plus they're just darn easy to set up. Um, so in this case, if you don't have two lights and two Apollos, I just threw this in there, um, you can actually do the same thing with a reflector down below. But you get an idea, yeah, this is a shoot you could do in manual mode, and you can open the softbox and turn the power light level on and off, but it's a pain to do that. Okay, I have in the past put a master in the top softbox, had the master connect to the camera on an extra long ETTL cord, and then the master, if the wind was blowing just the right direction, could sometimes control the slave in the bottom softbox and sometimes not. Okay? All right, very quickly, if you don't know where on your Canon camera the external speed light control menu is, find it. If you have an EX2 speed light, 430 EX2, 580 EX2, or the 320 EX, or the 270EX2, any of those speed lights, plus the new 600, of course, with a 40D or newer camera. So anything, any camera that's introduced in the middle of 2007 and newer, if you have that combination of gear, go find external speed light control, because that will totally revolutionize the way you shoot. Canon hasn't taken advantage of what I think is a huge competitive advantage. We can control every feature of our speed lights from the convenience of our camera's LCD. So if you shoot in dim light, you can see it. If you've got bad eyes, you can see it. If you don't understand what three fingers means, you can read it in English or Finnish or Spanish or whatever language you've coded into the custom function of your camera. All right? What's revolutionary to me this isn't revolutionary. What's revolutionary to me is the new user interface that Canon's implemented on the 2012 generation of cameras. All right? The only thing that will make this cooler, and I, had, I didn't have a chance to play with the T4i, which has a touch screen. I did get to swipe. Instead of having to turn the dial, it's just like an iPhone in terms of looking at your pics. You hit the review button, and you start swiping away, and there they go. I don't know if this works as a touch screen on the T4i or not. I hope Canon gets there someday, because that'll be amazing. But basically, in this mode, you hit and you say, yeah, I want to change the manual. I want to change the mode of the camera. So boom, they all pop up. And as you move the icon, the label changes. If you can't remember what that word multi means, it'll tell you. All right? This is the gateway to the wireless system. So in this case, we don't have the wireless on. We've got it in radio or we've got it in optical. All right? Zoom. I, again, you saw how I use this as a creative tool quite conveniently. So I can go in and I can dial the zoom. Now this only works, by the way, on the flash that's connected to the camera. So it's either in the hot shoe or it's at the end of an extra long ETTL cord. Wireless, we don't have control wirelessly of zooms on slaves. So slave zooms, you still have to dial in manually. But for your master, or if you're just working a single light system, you can do it here. All right, sync. There's the icon for first curtain sync. All right, with the, with the arrow on the left filled in. That's the icon they don't put on the back of the speed light. I don't know why. They never have. 
Now, one of the other great mysteries about Canon speed lighting, and unfortunately we don't have it with the current generation of technology, in wireless mode, Canon disables second curtain sync. Okay? Which is why I still carry extra long ETTL cords with me, because if you have it in manual mode, at the end of a 30 foot cord, you can do second curtain sync, make it look wireless, meaning make it look off camera. And I've got the exact optical slaves that will work with Canon speed lights. So if you've got that issue, get in touch with me and I'll totally turn you on to what you need to do. So, um, okay, flash exposure compensation, you get the idea. All of this, you know, channels, it's boom. You just go and find what you want. And there, this is the channel ID number. Uh, master enabled, master disabled, the flash groups, on and on and on. So it becomes an incredibly easy to use user interface. So if you're like a lot of my students, you shoot today and then you shoot three weeks from now, and life has gotten in the way in between those two times and you can't remember what everything is, the good news is with the current generation of lights and cameras, it's getting easier to get back to those special techniques that you're fond of without having to totally re-educate yourself. Last couple of shots I have, this is group mode, and so if you turn on in group mode, you head down there into that section and you change the mode and you change the power level or you turn those groups on and off. Um, in group mode. So whether you do this on the back of the speed light, the top of the STE3 controller, or on the back of your camera, it doesn't really matter because the good news is all the functionality is right, right there. So thanks for being here. Here's my final thought of the day. <laughs> Using flash is not a crime. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say thank you to everybody for coming and thank you to Canon for sponsoring this. And I'm happy to stay and answer any questions you guys might have about your gear. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.